I guess I can give you a quick disclaimer before I get going. My story, it's not easy to listen to. It's a hard journey. I'll tell you again, it was extremely difficult to live. Oh, we got another fight, Brady Lee. We've got that jackhammer right going. Saw a lot of things, did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Every waking moment, I just wanted to die. This is a really hard one. I see my story being told. There's obviously darkness in it, but I, I really hope that it's told and, and that people can see the light. I think my story begins being five years old. Being abused as a kid was the hardest thing that I've ever gone through. That definitely changed who I was. And in and around that time, my parents got separated and divorced, and there was a lot of sort of unanswered questions. Hockey was that constant. It was the one thing that I could do and count on every single day, where if I'm doing this, I don't have to think about anything else. That's what kept me going through all those years, and it was really my first addiction. It's actually kind of hard to look at this picture of me. I mean, a pretty young, innocent boy, even though I had a lot of things happen to me. This right here was where I felt the most safe. Hockey gear on, hockey stick in my hand. It was where I lit up. I'll tell you, hockey kept my mind off all the terrors that were in my mind for a long time, and it worked. It worked for a while. It was just constantly distracting myself from the pain that I was feeling inside. This one here, I'm 16, playing in Swift Current. This is when things like really started to, to weigh heavily on me. Now we got a fight. Owen oh, Lebel <laughs> just went after Chad Urban, rocked him with a right hand. Now they get together. Brady Lebel just loves to fight. I got an assist in my first game. And I remember calling my dad crying. And my dad's like, what's wrong? And I said something along the lines of, you know, dad, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. And he's like, well, what's wrong with Swift Current? You don't want to be in Swift Current? I said, no, dad, like, I don't know if I want to be alive anymore. I felt like I had nothing. I felt like I had no one. I didn't even want to go to the rink anymore because I was so worried. By this time, hockey had kind of stopped working as the medicine that it once was for me. You know, I got the nickname Baby. He can't hack it. He's a problem. The older guys, they took it upon themselves to, to do certain things to, to make my life and other rookies' lives a living hell. But I think it's important to remember that those, those older players, they were young guys once too. And, and they went through the same thing. That was the, the circle that was just never ending uh, for years and years in hockey. Or some people could think that that's good fun or that I should have handled it a better way. But what people didn't know is I was hanging on for dear life and hockey, that's all I felt that I had. You know, the drinking for me really, it, it escalated quickly. This year here is when I really started to go down a bad path of heavy alcohol and made a lot of, a lot of really bad, uh, a lot of bad choices. I thought of all the places in the world, hockey players just don't do drugs. But one decision changed my life forever. After I tried that pill once, and I'll tell you what it was, it was ecstasy. It all happened so fast. Hockey was able to, to keep me going. But when I lost that and I turned to drugs and alcohol, things got extremely dark. My last year in the Western Hockey League, I got traded to the Kelowna Rockets. People created their own narrative, their own picture of what I might be going through or what I'm going through. Most people just thought I was a bad guy, making bad choices, ungrateful, all those things. But inside, I'll tell you, every waking moment, I just wanted to die. A fight in the neutral zone. Leobold's gonna go at it here at center ice. And some big rights here from Leobold. It's a fantastic job by bringing Leopold, and Leopold has been a little grumpy of late. You know, definitely, it was fighting myself the whole time. I don't know, it was just this pursuit of destruction that I carried with me for a long time. I was at a party. It was the first time I ever saw cocaine in my life. I broke. I tried it. It was like a snap of the fingers. I became addicted to cocaine. Right in around that time, I signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning. That was always my dream, playing the NHL. I remember standing next to Steven Samkos. I thought I was unworthy. There's no question he was a better hockey player than I was, but 
again, you're putting on the same jersey, you're on the same ice, it couldn't have been that far off. Even though there is a big gap there, it's still right there. You know, I really don't like this picture at all. Look at my face in that picture. Does that look like somebody who's thrilled to have an NHL jersey on on the left there? I don't think so. I was really struggling. I felt like I didn't belong when they read the starting lineup and I'm going to play with him. I was up the night before with another guy partying. Again, not because it was deliberate, it was because when you're in that state of pain and darkness and you're living in survival, you just want to feel better now and you don't think about the consequences. It's Brady Leibold for Tampa Bay. Tyson Dowzek battling for the Rangers. I think they're going to break it up. Linesmen are talking with them, but they're not willing to let go just yet as Dowsett comes through with a couple more. Every part of me felt like I wanted to run away because I felt like I didn't belong because I was hiding all these secrets. I was hiding my drug problem. I was hiding my alcoholism. I was hiding my mental health struggles. And how can you work your whole life towards something and then you get there and you want to run away from it? This is my first paycheck from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Lightning hockey payroll, $2,600. To see that I was being paid by an NHL hockey team, it's in the name bar. I mean, it's, that's my name, that's an NHL logo, that's a Tampa Bay Lightning logo. Like, I understand that, but while I was there, I mean, I don't think I realized maybe my life could have been, maybe I could have been a full-time NHL player. Very shortly into my pro career of hockey, I injured my knee. That same night, the doctor threw me a bottle of pills. When I took that pill for the first time, thinking it was going to cure my knee, knee pain temporarily, which it did, I had no idea that it was also going to kill the emotional pain that I've been hiding my whole entire life. I thought there was a difference between Oxycontin and heroin. The only difference is one comes from the street and one comes from pharmacy. It's basically the same drug. And that was pretty much it. I mean, four games in the American League and 30-something in ECHL and just really struggle, lose everything, two years, go to rehab, go back to the CHL for 20 games and playoffs and thought that I was on my way in recovery, thought I was going to be in the American League the next year and I came home and I relapsed. Let me tell you, it just progressively got worse and worse and worse. I had no money, I was severely addicted and uh, I found myself on the downtown east side in Vancouver. I called my dad and um, I just told him, like, I need your help, like, I need some money, I have nothing. And my dad said, sorry, I can't help you. One of the, the, the lowest points in my life was when I felt like that one person that I had always counted on was no longer going to co-sign on my, my bad decision making and, and, and bail me out of situations. My body, mind, my spirit was screaming for these pills. So I resorted to finding them on the street. And things only progressively got worse until finally, in about 2014, I became an intravenous drug user. I still have the scars on my arm to show it. These scars are still pretty prevalent. I don't know if they'll ever fade. There was times when I thought about tattooing over them so I didn't have to look at them anymore. But this is part of my story. This is part of who I was. It's uh, sometimes hard to look at but it's also a constant reminder of, of knowing where I was, where I'm at today, and how quickly it could go back to this. It's hard to believe that you can go from being a pro hockey player to now homeless. I never thought I'd be homeless. And it wasn't just for a day, a week, a month. I was down there for a year. At this old flip phone, and I took a video on it, and it was a suicide letter video, basically just saying, like, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I ended up, you know, loading up a syringe with, with way too much, and um, I think it was just like another moment where I felt like a failure. I can't even do this right. I can't even, I can't even successfully follow through with, you know, trying to end my own life. When you stop digging, that's when you hit rock bottom. I just kept digging. And in 2016, I was sentenced to almost two years in jail. Up to that point, I had never really committed crimes or, or been that desperate. You know, eventually it all caught up with me and, and getting arrested and 
you know, a lot of police officers knew who I was because they were hockey guys going to jail and, and the guards, you know, some of them former Western Hockey League players that I fought and played against. It was, those are some pretty dark days. I really resented the game of hockey and honestly the people in it. I wasn't in a, in a place of accountability and taking ownership for my own choices. And though there's things that have happened to me over my life that maybe I didn't have control over, the vast majority of my struggles came from choices that I made. 2020, I eventually started to piece my life back together. I, uh, I found out that I was going to be a dad again. I've caused so much pain because I've been an absent dad in the past. I passed this lake and it felt like it was kind of calling to me. I knew that I, I didn't want to do drugs anymore, but I was also very overwhelmed that I had no money, no anything. All I knew was this life that I'd been living for the last almost 10 years of crime and destruction. It's like I had this conversation with myself. I still don't know if I actually had a conversation with myself or if I did hear a voice. And it was like, you're gonna do what right now? Who are you? <laughs> Brady, if you just turn around and go home, your life will get better than you could have ever imagined. And it was the, the greatest intuition that I've ever had in my entire life. It was the next day that I put my skates on and started to skate around the lake and everything just went quiet. All I could hear was the metal <laughs> into the ice. Ice meets metal, can't you drive me down to the big league? It definitely means more this time around putting skates on. I say thank you and I remind myself how lucky I am that, uh, that I get to do it again. It's really just like a dream come true. I've always wanted to have a family unit. I've obviously made some mistakes along the way and, and some relationships have been damaged, but I'm really grateful for my girls and, and for Jenna and, and the stability and support that I have now because just a few years ago, I would have never imagined that that it would have even been possible. Because I knew that he wasn't always in the position to be a dad, it's been really special to see him get to step into that and also see that it's absolutely how it is. He's his best self when he's a dad and when he's not getting to be you know, in that role all the time, you can see that it wears on him. Even in like middle school, I had uh, a question posed to me where it was, you know, what are your goals in life? And the first thing on there was to be a dad and number two was to be a professional hockey player. It's sometimes overwhelming to realize that I'm now in a place where I have these things because for many, many years it just seemed like it was never going to happen. It was so dark. And uh, though there's still some days that are hard, um, there's definitely a lot more light around here than dark. I feel very lucky to be alive. I feel very lucky to have these amazing people in my life. And um, I also feel like I'm in a place that I can be good for them too. So it's, uh, for once in my life, I, you know, I feel confident as a father. I feel confident as a partner. I feel really good about it. Welcome. Hockey to Hell and Back, episode number 128. When I started doing this show a few years ago, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only hockey player who struggled with mental health and addiction. And I found out real quick once I started to share my story that I, I was not alone. As I'm sitting here, I am aware of 115 hockey players who have sadly lost their life to mental health or addiction. You can see pictures behind me, just a few of them, but I'll never stop sharing my story. I'll never stop fighting for change. Without further ado, let's bring him in, my buddy, Nick Kiprios. Brady, how are you? Yeah, Kipper, doing well. Thank you so much, man. It was right at the beginning of COVID. I didn't know how I was gonna start it because I didn't own a computer. I didn't have a microphone. I didn't have a studio or anywhere to record it. But I had a thought and an overwhelming sense that if I do this, it's gonna help somebody. My dad was definitely nervous with 
with the idea of me starting a podcast, there's no question. I think there have been years and years of, of heartache and embarrassment and every other thing that he went through, but he knows his well, as I do, that when I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, so he, he really leaned into it. He, he bought me the microphone. Without him believing in me and supporting me, um, there's, a, there's probably a good chance I would have given up. Kind of where I want to start is just kind of where you see the game today as far as like a mental health standpoint. I'm very um, comfortable in saying that uh, we've made uh, tremendous strides in being aware of certain battles that uh, someone can have behind the scenes and being more sensitive to it. No doubt. And, and you know, I see it. I, I'm very fortunate. I kind of landed a dream position, if you will, uh, up here in Muskoka in the summertime. Sam Gagne hired me as a head coach. We had 40-something NHL guys come through our camp last summer. And just to see it firsthand where the guys are at is pretty incredible. There is a, always a piece of me that at the end of the summer when the guys are packing their bags and they're going to play, if I sat here and told you that there wasn't a little part of me that was like, mm, that would be uh, pretty awesome if I was still playing. But I've accepted where I'm at today and just to be a small part of the hockey community, it's such a gift. Here's Kulak trying to finish the check with Derek Ryan and support the in front of the score. Right on cue, Sam Gagne. It's just really cool to see him in person after we worked so hard all summer. It's incredible. It, it makes me extremely happy. Yeah, what's up, buddy? See you, buddy. Honestly, man, great game. Yeah, thank you. That was everything. You've been doing it a long time. You're still there, so let's keep it up. I'll see you tomorrow, right, yeah. okay? <laughs> One sec. Here, buddy. Have a good night, man. Literally, this guy on the ground, that was me. Like, no joke. Like, that guy right there, that was me taping a shoe or whatever. That's where I was. <laughs> Not that long ago. Oh, my God. I had seen your Instagram and kind of loved, uh, obviously, your story and what you were doing. And then you reaching out to me, I actually had kind of manifested. Yeah. I, I said to my girlfriend, I said, I, I'm going to be on the ice with Sam Gagne. Yeah, I said, yeah. your name and the guys. Yeah. And within a matter of weeks, you messaged me. And I remember looking at my phone and being like, is this real? Yeah. And then, yeah, it, uh, yeah just so appreciative of that. And we've yeah. been able to forge a friendship. One of the things you and I talk about a lot is everyone goes through their own kind of struggle, right? You've gained such a valuable perspective with all the different things that you've gone through. It's opened my, eye, my eyes even more to the fact that yeah, let, let, let's be open about things and, and get through them together. I mean, that, that's the only way forward, really. You know, he said to me multiple times, like, I'm, I'm so thankful for this opportunity. And I, I continue to say to him, like, you, you've earned this opportunity and you continue to earn it every day. To be able to walk into a rink now, regardless if it's a, a small town in Ontario or it's an NHL arena, you know, I can walk in with my head up and feel comfortable in a rink. It took a while to get there. You're running things, right? I'm just buzzing yeah. around, right? Okay. How long have we been playing hockey for? As long as you can remember. I love that. Get that? <laughs> I'm just buzzing around, talking to kids. They're doing their thing. Absolute immense gratitude to everybody who supported me to get here. I'm going to hit him with the Steven Stamkos behind the back. Oh, what a save! What a save! It feels really good to know that I can be present and I can, I can share my, my love, my passion and my skill and my knowledge of the game that has caused so much hardship but also saved my life so many times. Oh, you got the puck support sticker on your helmet. Puck support started after I heard the story of Matthew Lazinski and, and my former teammate Mitch Fadden. It was the first two hockey players that I heard of really that had passed away of overdose outside of the Derek Bugard story. So what we do here at Puck Support is we remember those hockey players. Right here in my shirt, I have Daniel Miner, former Barry Colt. He sadly passed away of an overdose in 2021. We've had thousands of orders from all over the world. And as a part of that, we honor and remember a hockey player who's lost their life to suicide or overdose. If there's a hockey player that's struggling, that needs help, that needs to go to treatment, that needs some counseling or whatever that may be, that's where I want Puck Support to come in. Today I get up here and I tell you bits and pieces of my story, 
things that I would have never told anybody just a few short years ago. As soon as I was willing to stand up and reach my hand out, boy, was I thankful that I had this whole community rally around me. Because without hockey and the people in it, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm not here today. This is not a story, this is not a movie, this is real life, and um, I am living proof that people can and do recover and people can change. So this is from 1997, I was 10 years old. There's a quote of the week underneath my player profile that says, when bad times come, you can let them make you bitter or use them to make you better. And this is, man, almost 30 years ago. You are not alone, regardless of what you're going through. I promise you, you're not alone. I've never been more sure of this in my entire life. Vulnerability is strength. Just keep fighting. If something doesn't work out the first time, keep fighting. You're so worth it. I'm Brady Liebold. I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a retired pro hockey player. I'm an advocate for mental health and substance abuse. I'm somebody that just wants to show the world that there is hope.